For those of you who are still running Microsoft Exchange Server, uh, Brian Krebs does go into a little bit of detail here. He had some uh, feedback from some of the uh, industry uh, analysts and vendors that talks about some of the concerns with this. The vulnerability on Exchange Server is one where if you're up to the latest CUs for whichever version of Exchange Server you may still be running, <clears throat> This new feature is turned on by default, or this feature is turned on by default. But the uh, let's see, yeah, here he calls it out here: extended protection for authentication. After a certain CU level, in the case of 2019, it's cumulative update 14. That's turned on by default. If you're running a CU level prior to that, you need to go and turn this on. That is the number one priority is, are you at the right CU level where that's on by default? Or if you're not, have you turned this feature on? If you did, much of the risk of this vulnerability is mitigated. It's not eliminated, but it's mitigated to reduce the possibility of this being abused. Now, that doesn't mean you don't push the exchange update. You should get this into your regular um, uh, test cycles because this one is particularly nasty. It's an elevation of privilege but one that also could allow the attacker to gain access to NTLM hashes. For that local system that's compromised, they could then scrape a bunch of identities off of um, credential uh, information to be able to use elsewhere. So this is a perfect kind of scenario for the attacker to elevate privileges and also to grab some identities to start fueling their lateral movement throughout your environment. So. Number one priority for Exchange users, make sure you're at the right CU level, that that extended protection is turned on by default. If you're not, go in and make sure that you've turned it on. Microsoft had some extensive uh, information about that within the, the CVE page there, um, and they've got links to other Exchange server blog uh, information and other things there. That's the number one thing to look for on the Exchange side. The Office update this month. Again, not currently actively being exploited, but Microsoft is concerned and other um, analysts are concerned about this one because it is, again, another nasty kind of perfect vulnerability for threat actors to take advantage of. The Microsoft Office CVE 2024-21413 is a critical, a high CVSS score. It allows the attacker to basically bypass security measures, so the mark of the web um, protected view is not being honored if they craft a, a file the right way. Um, that allows them to bypass that. It can also be um, the Outlook preview pane is an attack vector. So the user doesn't even have to open the email if they, you know, if it gets into their inbox and they scroll past it and it comes up in the preview pane, execute it. It, it can uh, uh, take advantage of that and uh, to do whatever it is they've uh, crafted that to do. So remote code execution, um, they could cause a file to open in edit mode, even though the user had not uh, intended to do so. So those are ones where, while it's not being actively exploited, definitely you don't want to hold off too long on on you know making sure that you've got Exchange and Office going through uh, their testing paces and make sure that they get rolled out in a reasonable time frame. Uh, the next one here, again, just kind of gives a slightly different variation on some of, some of the perspectives here. So more fuel for the fire if you need the right information to bring to other parts of your organization to drive remediation activities. So just trying to give you some of the information you need to help there. Um, one of the things that they touch on too in theirs was the DNSSEC vulnerabilities. So this is a part of the Windows OS update this month. Um, it has a bit more of a far-reaching kind of uh, potential impact, which I've included another article here. Um, now, this is a news article. There's more knowledge-type articles that get into more of the, you know, the gory details of what exactly is going on. Uh, this is kind of outlining the, the danger of this particular vulnerability. Uh, what researchers and uh, uh, the Center for Applied Cybersecurity are calling the worst attack on DNS ever discovered. Um, you know, the potential risks of this one are real. Um, it could uh, be a very painful impact if somebody were to try to start attacking this one on a broad scale. Um, so details about that in here, again, for the Windows side, uh, Microsoft 
identified it as a third party CVE that they were talking about. It's because they're using DNSSEC uh, in Windows DNS and they have a, an update that they have to provide to be able to resolve that vulnerability. Um, so those are the additional um, things that you wanna be aware of there. Um, in other news, a couple other things that uh, were interesting out there. This one in particular, um, there's been a lot of speculation about deep fakes, um, generative AI being used to uh, drive more and more sophisticated scams. Well, we've got the, the uh, biggest example yet of this in real life. So a deep faked uh, video conference convinced an employee to basically give up $25 million across multiple accounts um, because they thought they were being asked to do this by their, uh, their own employees, their leadership. Uh, so it talks about um, this particular one. I, I thought this article from CPO Magazine did a good job of talking about the feasibility of, and I believe this one, yep, uh, be, it talks about the possibility of AI enhanced fraud becoming more and more effective by the day, uh, not possibility of, the actual occurrence of. So it's a good read. It goes into a lot of detail and uh, talks about, um, you know, the impacts and what, you know, people should be thinking about. Uh, but that was a... If you haven't seen that one yet, uh, it's definitely one to be aware of because it's going to be more and more prevalent. Chip makers also had a number of updates, so there could be there could be some things here with um, AMD and Intel um, yeah. updates going through. Now, this is always kind of a, a tangled web of once the the chip vendors release their updates then all of the oems have to take it in on their side and you know do their updates and uh, all the different layers that it has to go through um so this is more of a on the horizon expect that you know there's going to be some uh chipset updates and other things coming here the writer here goes into a number of different uh, uh vulnerabilities that were resolved between the different vendors um so just kind of a, if you want to read more into it, uh, there's some details in there about that, but it's more of an awareness of there will be some, you know, uh, there's some necessity to keep updating drivers and uh, uh, firmware within your organization. For those of you on the Linux side, this last one here is, I'm not going to get into the, the sides of this conflict, but the kernel is now becoming its own CNA. Um, so CVE numbering authority, this means that they're basically going to be a gatekeeper for any CVEs that are opened against the kernel. Um, there's a lot of controversy in these threads. I'm putting it in here more as a expect that there's um, some changes with how CVEs for Linux kernel are going to be uh, treated in the future here. Some doomsayers are saying it's going to be the worst thing ever. Some others are saying, hey, it's actually going to put some uh, clarity around things so that somebody can't just go in, scrape uh, some random password uh, reference and say, CVE, do this. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, good and bad in the discussions there. Um, I think overall, it's a sign of this part of the uh, Linux world trying to mature itself. You can see that many of the big vendors in other areas have become their own CNA as well. Microsoft, Google, a number of them are. There's uh, good and bad to each of those things, um, but just a, more of an awareness that this is happening there. If you haven't heard about it, it may be something that if you're heavily in the Linux world, that could be something that you want to keep, keep track of. All right. So we are going to move into the two new uh, exploited vulnerabilities this month. So out of the 73 net new vulnerabilities, two of them were zero days on the Microsoft side. Um, the first one is the Windows Smart Screen Security Feature Bypass. 7.6 CVSS score, um, only rated as important, or no, this was the one that was rated by mo as moderate by Microsoft. Um, throw all that out. This is actively being exploited. I gave you several articles uh, before talking about threat actors who are actively using this vulnerability today in campaigns. 
these are static assessments and not relevant to the real world risk. So in a risk-based perspective, this is a critical vulnerability. You wanna get this rolled out in a timely fashion and, and make sure to close this gap quickly because there are active campaigns currently being executed against this. Uh, so security feature bypass and smart screen, what this allows the attacker to do is bypass the mark of the web uh, feature within uh, the smart screen. So as you download something, if it comes from the internet, it gets a specific zone identifier. And when it tries to be opened, it's going to be interrogated to look for things like it's gonna do reputation checks and it's going to pop up in a protected view or you know different things like that. All of those kind of go aside if the attacker is able to bypass that and uh, work around that identi zone identifier. So with that, the attacker can convince a user to open a specially crafted file. They say it like it's a, a difficult thing or not gonna be something that the attacker will be able to achieve. In reality, I think we all know it's a statistical challenge, not an actual difficulty. If I get enough people in my campaign, I will absolutely get several of them to open what I want. We've seen generative AI making it even easier for things to be crafted and tailored to the target that is going to receive that. So more and more phishing of this type is becoming easier once again for the attackers. If they successfully exploit this, the vulnerability could bypass the smart screen user experience. The vulnerability allows a, an attacker to inject code into smart screen and potentially gain code execution, which could then lead to some data exposure, lack of system availability or both. Um, so again, actively being used in the wild, um, this is confirmed exploited. So it's not academic at this point, it's real. Um, it is in uh, basically all currently supported versions of the OS. Guarantee that it's probably in many unsupported versions of the OS as well. But if you're still running those, you know that you're not going to get the security updates there, but this threat is still potentially very real for those systems. Um, so that is the update for the first one. Second one is the internet shortcut files security feature bypass. Uh, that's the theme this month, security feature bypass. Um, the severity on this is important. The CBSS score, 8.1. Um, the, uh, let's see here, going down. Again, exploit has already been detected in the wild and there's uh, specific threat actors have campaigns around this um, that, you know, basically, again, there it's not a if, it's a when at this point. Uh, an attacker must send the user a malicious file to convince them to open it. Again, statistical challenge, not hard to do. If they do that, they could send the user a targeted uh, targeted user, a specially crafted file that's designed to bypass displayed security checks. However, they would have no way to force the user to view an attacker controlled bit of content. So they have to convince them to do so. Again, it's just a phishing challenge at that point. They, they will get in with enough attempts. Um, so both features, uh, scrolling down to the affected again, windows OS is where this one is resolved again this month. Uh, so those on top of the criticals that were in the OS update this month, basically, uh, this is your number one priority. Uh, we also talked about the office update with a uh, particularly nasty, uh, vulnerability that can uh, take advantage of the preview pane. Um, so that would definitely be one that I would urge you to also try to get out as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, this is your top priority this month is the OS update. Okay. Going off of the screen share and back over to just the slides. On the Linux side, once again, there were a couple of other notable things here. Um, this one is a particular vulnerability in um, Red Hat. It's a flaw in shim. It's an open source bootloader maintained by Red Hat. The vulnerability enables an attacker to craft a specific malicious HTTP request, which could lead to getting a um, you know completely controlled out of bounds right uh, and basically giving them the ability to compromise the system. So uh, five other vulnerabilities were also affecting shim that were discovered um, when uh, this all came up. Uh, so they have 2023 CVEs, but with the way the Linux world works, CVEs are identified and it takes a little while to, to kind of bubble up through the, the, all the different components and get rolled out. Um, so 
typically there's a little bit more of a lag time on a lot of CVEs getting resolved across different platforms. In this case, this one's probably moving a little bit faster because it's specifically a Red Hat contain or maintained component. One thing for those of you who have been looking at the Linux slides, I actually updated the hyper or the highlighted by Tuxcare. So Tuxcare is our one of our Linux partners. Uh, they do some interesting things, including um, support for live patching. Um, the Linux world lets us do some things that the Windows world doesn't do today, or Mac for that matter. Um, they have the ability to do this live patching approach, which makes it so you could actually update even the kernel on a Linux system and not have to reboot. Um, so interesting things there if you're more interested, but most important is if you click on that highlighted by Tuxcare, you will actually be taken to Tuxcare's CVE portal where you can actually go in and look up. They, they keep a lot deeper tracking around um, the vulnerabilities and how they're getting rolled out through many different distros. So again, the Linux world being open source, uh, there's a little bit more sprawl once a vulnerability is identified. So if a kernel vulnerability comes out, which distros get it and at what time varies quite a bit at times. Um, so that portal gives you a way to go in and research and get deeper into something. So if your security team is worried about a specific CVE, they've got some great ways to go and track more detail around that. Second Linux vulnerability for this month that we're looking at is uh, CVE 2023-6780. It's a glibc vulnerability that affects most distributions um, out there. Um, it's possible to abuse a buffer to trigger um, undefined behavior, which can then elevate privileges on the local system. Um, so they've got a couple of things here where uh, the attacker could call it by syslog or uh, vsyslog. Um, they give you a little bit of detail about that. And there's also some uh, mitigations provided if you get your glibc version to 2.39 or higher to uh, reduce the possibility of exploiting this type of vulnerability. And I think we got one more. Yes, one more on the Linux side, CVE 2024-1086. Use after free vulnerability. It's in the net filter subsystem in the Linux kernel. Uh, so talks a little bit about uh, the additional context here. If it's in, uh, it enables various networking related operations to be implemented in the form of customized handlers. Uh, so this vulnerability allows uh, the attacker to crash or abuse those handlers to try to be able to use uh, those memory spaces after they're supposed to have been freed up. Mitigation here, you either prevent the affected net filter um, kernel module from being loaded or disable user namespaces. So you've got a couple options there if you need to mitigate that until um, updates are available to resolve those in your environment. All right, a couple of other updates of interest. A lot of this gets into more of the servicing stack updates and the development tools. So if your organization is running any type of DevOps um, organization within your company, releasing internal applications or web, web uh, platforms or something like that. Many of these tools may be used within your environment. So this is the list of components on the Azure and development tools side that were updated this month. Um, again, many of you may not be directly responsible for those, but in the broader scope of vulnerability management across your enterprise, these are things that also need to be updated um, to address security vulnerabilities there. Lifecycle wise, we don't have any immediate lifecycle changes coming. So uh, good news for right now, we get a little bit of a reprieve. We've had uh, you know, the uh, 2012 end of life occurred towards the end of last year. Many of you are continuing with support there. Um, we've engaged with a number of you to uh, enable catalog content for, for that. Um, if you are planning to continue running 2012 for some time and have not done that, Again, with the vulnerabilities we talked about there, 2012 was affected by many of those as well. It's definitely a good idea to look into if you're gonna continue running it for a period of time uh, to make sure you're securing that more. All right, and the long-term service branch as well. This gets a little bit more complicated, so we've broken it out into a separate table here. Um, 
Chris, we did get a lot of questions last month about that. Yep. Uh, Server 2019 mainstream support ending last month, um, 1 9 2024. And the reality is that it hasn't gone into ESU, that Microsoft uses the terminology, extended security updates. It's just that they break their support into two, two threads. There's like a five yep. year and then there's a 10 year. And so they identify mainstream support as, you know, new features and things like that ending. It doesn't mean yep. that there are not security updates for the next five years. So it'll still show up as a normal update. Just don't expect any major feature changes or uh, performance enhancements at this point. Yep. Absolutely. Thanks, Todd, for bringing that up again, just to make sure people are aware. Um, last one here, and then um, I did have one question that I'll address real quick here uh, before we move into the rest. Uh, but if you are using one of the Avanti products, you can go and subscribe to content updates for your particular product's content streams. Uh, so that's the forum page where you can go and sign up for those. Mm -hmm.